me is based around an iconic red chair. And there's so many things that a chair really embodies. It's about sitting for the future of technology. It's about not standing for anything less than women's full participation in computing. And I hope this campaign really helps us understand that. We need more women in the workforce. We need their creativity. We need their skills. We've learned over time that you can't build great products if you don't have a team that empathizes with and understands the audience that the product is for. We're doing the Sit With Me campaign because we want the world to know that women are great technical thinkers. And it's time to do it now. I think the world needs a campaign like Sit With Me in order to ignite a commitment towards really driving more women into careers in technology. You know, the women who are dedicated in computer science, who go into math, who go into other technical areas, they're great. And it starts with believing they can do it. As a mother, I want to break the stereotype to show my daughters that, hey, you can go to that engineering class. So it's part of telling that story that's important for me. We want women helping to solve the problems that the world faces. That's what we hope this campaign provides a catalyst for. We sent out an email a couple of weeks ago about our International Women's Day event, and wouldn't it be a great idea to have this red chair? The campaign is getting lots of great buzz here at Microsoft. We had about 100 people here to talk about the powerful contributions of women in tech. They want to hear more. They want to get involved. We want you to have a sit with me event, or host a photo shoot, or use the chair as an award program or have a stealth campaign. Just do it. It's not hard. You can request a red chair, you get some people together, you take some pictures and you upload it to the site. It's just easy. To think about the community. How can we get the community involved? They're going to take this iconic red chair places that we could have never imagined and that is the creativity of this campaign. People who aren't necessarily a part of the process, that's a loss for not just the rest of us who don't get that perspective but also for them who don't get to shape the future that, that is going to come to exist. This isn't just a company versus company issue, it's a societal issue that we're trying to change. At the end of the day, we'll know Sit With Me successful if we have created a conversation around the importance of women's participation in computing. And not just amongst technologists, but everywhere. on the eve of Google I.O., which we're very excited for. Uh, kicks off tomorrow morning, and all of a sudden there's already been a, a set of events. Um, I want to welcome my co-panelists up. Uh, come on up, you guys, and uh, we'll do some quick intros. We wanted to play the video that you just saw, because there's several red chairs in the room, and uh, one of our partners, NC Witt, which is the National Center for Women in Information and Technology, um, kind of made this idea, uh, with these guys coming up, of who has a red chair in here? There's one, there's one. So you can see some of them. And so we encourage you, get a, red, get a bunch of red chairs into your company and uh, kind of make a visual statement about having more women in technology in the room. Uh, we thought it was a great campaign and wanted to highlight it as we kick off this panel. Um, one of our goals tonight is to have, give a chance to the women and some of the men who've joined us uh, to hear, out of the women of I.O., Google I.O., hear from some of the women at Google. Um, who are amazing leaders. And we want to talk about two things. One is uh, technology and leadership and building incredible products and some of the experiences uh, we have had and you guys have had doing that. Um, and then also we want to talk about women in technology and some of the experiences and some of the things, the challenges we all face and how you know things have gotten a lot better and they're getting better, but we still have a ways to go. So we'll kind of cover both of those topics. But let's start with introductions. So Susan Wojcicki. working? Yeah. There we go. All right. Uh, good evening. It's great to see everybody here. Welcome. And uh, we're all looking forward to I.O. tomorrow. Um, so I'm Susan Wojcicki. I'm the senior vice president responsible for our advertising products um, and the building and design of our future advertising products. We were working on building all the th great things that uh, we'll release over the next coming, coming years. If this works. Can you hear me? Uh, my name is Angela Lai. Um, I'm a vice president of engineering. Um, I'm responsible for uh, the Google Wallet and the payments team. Um, my team is responsible for, for money that flows through the company. And uh, it's great to be here, <laughs> part of my team. Between Angela and Susan, I think we have yeah. like basically most Susan of Susan and I actually work together. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, part of my team actually is in San Francisco here, and I, I work out of San Francisco. 
Hi, I'm Anna Patterson. I'm director of engineering and Android. I'm in Google Play. I'm responsible for books and search and recommendations. I'm Guy Sri Rajan. I'm the director of product management. I used to work with Angela on payments, um, and I recently moved to Google Office. And I'm, I'm Megan Smith. I, I am currently working on Google X. I just shifted, but for a long time I led new business development at Google, which is the biz dev team that helps these guys when they are starting new products. And also got to work on a lot of fabulous acquisitions with amazing teams that we were lucky to bring into Google. Um, so I guess one is maybe sort of a, a history thinking question. Um, think about some of your early experiences. And we'd love to hear from you guys a little bit of what were some of the things that prepared you the most, different experiences that prepared you most for um, what you're doing now, just by way of sort of almost examples for people, things that, that you came across. Anybody got any ideas there? Like some early experiences, Jason? Well, I, uh, I'll start. Um, I'm not sure really like any one thing prepared me. I was lucky I joined Google when it was a really small company. Um, I joined as the 16th employee. Susan um, was our, our the yeah. Google landlord. Yeah. For people who don't know, Larry and yeah. Siri moved into her garage. So, yeah. so I've <laughs> this is her first experience <laughs> with them. So I've been, um, I, I joined first as a first marketing person. And um, at the time, I had um, very little practical experience as marketing. I had a degree. I had an MBA. Um, so I can't really say uh, like there was any one thing that prepared me. It was definitely... Uh, working, like I grew as a company grew. And I took on new challenges. There was always new things that I thought I wasn't really sure I could do. I had never really done them before. Um, but each time I did them, I kept building that skill set. And so over the course of the last, um, it's been 13 years that I've been at Google, um, I've been able to build a really great skill set. So um, I, I will say, like, my first job was uh, being a product manager at a really small little startup. And um, I really got the passion for technology there and the passion for building products. And, um, and, I, and I learned by being at that company that you needed to be more than a technologist, though, that you also had to have some business skills because the company went out of business, um, <laughs> <laughs> even though I thought I built a great product. Um, and so then I got interested in also building business skills. I'll piggyback on that. The, the Google culture, you know, it's a, it's a very supportive culture, and we really believe in lifetime learning. And at the company, you know, both informal and, 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 and formal, we have classes to help people get through things much like we go through school. At the same time, um, as a company, we always try to shoot for really ambitious projects, and that's a way to stretch ourselves, to, to make ourselves learn. Um, and we always try different things. We're constantly trying different things, and the, the culture of experiment is, is there and available for us. And so it's, it's for me at Google, it's, it's, it's a lifetime of learning to continue to better ourselves. I had a, a very early conversation, which I'm sure Susan doesn't remember, but um, I was pretty new at the company, and um, I was saying, I can't even remember the project, but I said that something needed to be done. And um, she said, do it. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and so that kind of culture of, you know, you see something and um, you gather a team together and, and solve a problem is, is definitely one that I really value because it helps us get stuff done. So my early experience um, may not be early for you, it was early for me. I, was a, I became a mother uh, in my early 20s. And um, in many ways, that prepared me for the career that followed because as a mother, I had to learn. One of the first things you have to learn is to give up control, mm -hmm. uh, to go with the <laughs> flow, um, to let opportunity, you know, to seek opportunities where, where they may arise rather than having a very um, strict plan. Um, it also taught me how to multitask because I had to. But I think more importantly, most importantly, it taught me to really care about the work that I was doing um, because it matters. It matters when you have something else you, you could do instead. Um, it, it, really, it really focuses you. It makes you want to do something even better than what you might have wanted to do before. And, and I think you need that passion. Uh, you need that flexibility. And you need the ability to just manage 100 things at once at Google. Mm -hmm. And I think it's my children taught me <laughs> how to survive this place. 
think you know we've been working in uh, you know in the tech world so much that you know startups are like that. They're just like a free for all, and you know it's just coming at you, and you just have to try to rise to the occasion. So that's I think a pretty good example. There's a great book that Alice Walker wrote. Um, it's called We Are the Ones We've Been Waiting For, and I always think about you know the things you guys just said about about Google. We it's it's our company, and we just have to you know make it what it's going to be. And I think that when you, if you're in a startup or in a larger company, if you take ownership like that, you, you see a lot of um, benefits on that, uh, not only for what your company's going to achieve, but also what you'll get to be part of within that. So I think it's good advice. So, so actually, one thing on that I think it's an interesting perspective is um, actually when I first joined Google, they said, we're going to hire you a boss. Because I was like, well, I'm a marketing manager. I just graduated. I have my MBA. And they said, well, you know, we're going to hire a VP of marketing, and you'll report to that VP of marketing. And I waited, and I waited, I waited for years for the VP of marketing. And, um, and so I learned that you know, I wasn't gonna have a person coming and telling me what to do, that I just had to figure out what are the right things for us to do. You know, I, and we used to have this motive, like act like an owner. Like, you know, so that really indirectly helped me because I, wasn't, I had no one to go to for direction. I had to figure it out. And so it was very much a sink or swim situation. And so I do think, um, that that is a like a really valuable experience where you you know need to figure out yourself what are the important things to get done. One of the things um, that that I did you know in thinking a little bit we have an extraordinary number of very talented women uh, throughout Google and also in leadership at Google we're really lucky uh, that our company values diversity and talent inclusion and so we see that on this particular panel I asked these guys uh, because they're engineering and product leaders and they've built amazing products that are, you know, in the beginning it was millions of people, now really all of you have built things that are affecting billions of people. And so maybe to sort of step up, staying with tech, um, into innovation. And how, how do you lead teams? How do you come up with an early ideas? How do you listen for ideas? Can you talk a little bit about sort of experiences of being on this crazy rocket ship and, and trying to start new things and then turn them into what they have become? We can go ahead. Angela, um, so things change in a technical world, um, you know, very, very quickly. And you know, there is our job, and we deal with it. And the way that you know, speaking of engineering, the way that we do engineering, you know, some ten years ago, is very different from the way that it is today. And um, I, I will continue to vouch for the really important part of the Google culture um, that we continue to learn, and we're not afraid to change. And that's part of the culture. And you need to continue to, to spread that. And every time the, the spirit of pushing yourself beyond the comfort zone, what more can we do? And look outside of our bounding boxes um, and figure out, can we try it and find a way to try it? And I think trying not to say no um, and really trying to think, continue to just sort of encourage ourselves and continue to encourage a team to think about ways of looking at our jobs differently. And um, some of my colleagues would say, every year they figure out how to blow the job and, and try it again, right? I mean, really get out of the mood of what you're doing day to day, what seems to be important to you today, and try to get a new perspective. Um, and I think that constantly putting ourselves in, in a zone of thinking that, well, if I weren't me, if I were Susan, how would I do this? If I were somebody else outside of Google, how would we look at this product? Um, and I think trying to get a different perspective all the time is important. Any other thoughts about innovation leading? One of the things that was interesting to me is watching Susan. Um, you were on maternity leave and we bought DoubleClick. And we were just kind of wandering around trying to figure out what to do. Susan was a big part of deciding to do that. But then she was gone when we were doing integration. It's, we need Susan. It's because the review took so long. <laughs> I was able to have a baby in between. <laughs> it's true. It's amazing. So, you know, just how do you, you know, all of a sudden thousands of people, you know, join the company. How do you, what do you do? How do you lead? How do you help people um, put something like that together? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the trick on innovation and on managing teams and, and figuring out the right sets of things to do is, first of all, to figure out where you're going. Um, and being able to say, this is the vision. This is where we know we want to be in two years um, or like next year. And... Um, then working backwards. And so if you have a vision, you know, everybody can rally around that. Everyone can start to understand what's important about it. They can be motivated, about, motivated by it. 
Um, and then you can start figuring out what are the things that we need to do to get there. And so that I, I think is always like the number one you know, thing to do. And then I think the second thing is you know, just putting the right people in place um, and, and, um, and questioning. Um, that's, I think you, there's always like a, a challenge of like teams think they can only do this much, but then if you inspire them or challenge them or they have to, they somehow manage to go a little bit further or do it a little bit better. And um, there's always a challenge of how do you get people to really want to do that? And I think a big part is believing in that mission, being excited, being compelled, believing that it's what they want to do. And I think another important side, um, you know, even as you get people rallied around the objective um, and have them think about new ideas to excel, um, you have to be pretty strict uh, and fairly disciplined about making sure that the ideas that aren't helping that vision, um, that they don't take up airtime mm -hmm. and they don't distract from, um, from the mission. So that can, that can often be the harder part of the job because mm -hmm. it's, it's so much nicer <laughs> getting people forward. It's, it's harder sometimes restraining um, some of this, but it has to be done. Mm -hmm. So it's a balance. But as Susan said, if you have the right vision and if you've communicated it, um, people will come up with the ideas. It's, it's almost an easy job for a leader to, to just harvest to them. To crowdsource or harvest them, <laughs> right. Can somebody, yeah, yeah Anna, go ahead. Um, I also try to get people who actually really believe in the vision and who have uh, a lot of passion about contributing. And with every project, there's the exciting bits and the boring bits. And so I try to actually give each person an exciting bit and a boring bit. So they actually get the boring bit done, <laughs> and they go on to the exciting bit. And the great thing about that is then you can give them another boring bit, right? Consistent. We, also, we have a really great uh, OKR system, objective and key results, and we really use it with a lot of discipline within the company. I don't know if anyone wants to say a sentence about like, sort of how we do that, what we, what we do with the process. It's a process. We drive ourselves crazy with it, but we do it. Yeah, so it's objectives and key results. This actually speaks to how we discipline ourselves. Um, one thing that is important, like what Susan was saying, having a vision is knowing what you're trying to drive to. So the objective lists what you're actually trying to get to, not the task that you're trying to do, what not, not, um, you know, not how you're going to get there. It's actually describe the actual objective. And the key result as a results-driven company um, is to actually define what makes you successful. What makes you know the, the what makes us happy about what we think whether we have achieved the objective, and so it's not about creating a last a task list even though we, we have to figure out which are the boring bits and which are the exciting bits that eventually we work on, um, but it's a way to get everybody to be empowered to understand the goal objectives of what e every team every individual, the overall company. Um, at the different levels, we define these objectives and key results. So people believe in what they're doing, understand what we're drive, trying to drive to, and then everybody has a part of responsibility and drive towards the same place. So it's a very empowering way for the team to figure out how to get in sync um, and how to prioritize therefore what's important, what we're trying to get to. And we can also look back at it and say, well, we planned that, and, and sort of do a retrospective on was that a, was that a good set of things to measure to start with? And if we were measure our own success by that, what do we learn from it? And that's how we continue to innovate by reflecting upon ourselves what we've actually done periodically. We tried, yeah. No, I was just gonna say, I think that the OKRs are sometimes like a really good way of pushing us. Um, and so like I, one example was when we worked on AdSense in the very early days, we were getting, supposed to get the online version of AdSense out. And um, I think either Sergey or Larry, they just made up this date. And they said, you're gonna get it done by April 15th. <laughs> and, and we were like, really? Um, and magically, we launched it like two days late. It was like April 17th. Um, but that like stake in the ground of let me see if you guys can get it done by this time really motivated people. And um, it, it made us more efficient at getting, really getting that out. Which is great. And, and also like having the habit of setting stretch goals like as part of the goals and then letting your team not achieve 100%, but try to get to 80% and then set more stretch goals. I think it's also been like a great system. Um, maybe turn a little bit towards uh, women in tech. Um, somebody gave me these interesting numbers. One of them is uh, that last year, um, 
you know, I think it's 54% of the 2011 Intel Science Fair finalists um, were in biochemistry. And so you're seeing this rise in bio, in, 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 you know, in chem, and sort of the regular sciences. I am on the MIT board, and it, the undergraduates are about half women, and we're seeing about 80% of the architecture school is women, and, uh, and the sciences school, but we're not seeing it in computer science. And so some of the stats that were really interesting to me recently going to the Computer History Museum, which Susan has recently joined the board of, I encourage you to go. They have this amazing revolution exhibit that shows the 2,000 years of computing history. But in the 80s, the computer science uh, balance was much more even. About 40% of the computer scientists were women, largely due to IBM um, and, and other trends. And now we're really graduating. I think it's 14% of the women in uh, graduating last year were in computer science, of, um, of people in computer science were women. And 18% if you take all IT type degrees. So really just very low numbers given the impact we all have and the profound impact of the, the tools that computer science brings into the world. So I don't know if people had comments um, and, and thoughts about that. And I want to open up the questions. But um, we're doing a lot of things with women at Google uh, to build community and recruiting and, and those ideas. But maybe talk about some of the programs we have um, or other thoughts you guys have. What do you think is um, going so on there? The NC Board, um, the video that we produced has the Sit With Me campaign that uh, Google sponsors. Um, the idea of the, of the, of, of the campaign is, is to talk about it. Um, we don't know whether it's you know, scientifically proven or not, but there are, um, we, we think out of studies that we see that there are, there are some unintentional bias, um, uh, gender bias around whether women are technical or not. Um, and I don't know about each one of you, um, but the idea of the red chair is to just have that conversation. Um, is to it has it has this icon that you know you can you can get a chair from NC with, and just have that conversation. Um, whether you have a gender bias on whether you should be in technology or not, whether people in technology should be you know should be moving up the ladder, um, become become leaders in technology. Um, it has it has had very good effect mostly to just generate the conversation, um, because I think a lot of it is unintentional bias. And we don't really know why. But once you notice it, then you know, you know, the community will self-correct for it. And that's the idea behind the campaign. You know, the products we build, um, they're intended for men and women. And the product that I'm on, Google offers, I mean, it's women like shopping. This is, um, mm -hmm. this is something that's. And are <laughs> responsible for a lot of shopping yes, across the family. Are very loyal yeah. buyers. Um, so I think, I think somewhere. Um, so it's, it's clear that everything we do, we're doing for men and women. Um, somewhere in the pipeline, um, there is a perception that technology is, is very male. And mm -hmm. I think what we have to do, and this is, this is a responsibility of everyone in the room uh, who is in technology, is to really make, uh, is to tell the story of what we do right. in a way that appeals to girls. Um, and, and I say girls, not women, because by the time they're women, it's too late. Um, so we have to find a way to translate, uh, if, if, they're, if they're not interested in video games, you know, find a way, maybe it's a social game or, um, or, or a game around philanthropy or, 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 or giving that, they, that appeals to them and really find a way to tell a story of technology in a way that resonates with women. I don't think we do that enough. I think as a career, it's very social and I think media you know portrays it um, and a, a lot of people their stereotypes in other industries think it's a very loner thing and actually working in an engineering team you know is um, a remarkably together thing like rowing crew together I mean it's really um, intense uh, social interactions and a lot of teamwork and so I think uh, women could bring a lot to it and they bring a lot to their teams I'm always surprised there aren't more women um, because I think if you look at technology as a field, it's such a new field um, and there's so much opportunity. And, and to me, that means that there isn't really time for to be biased. If you have a great product, it doesn't really matter um, who's the person who's running that, that product. If you have a great company, 
Um, there's lots of, like, if you have a great idea, there's lots of opportunity. There's so much opportunity here that women have that. Um, they, I think once they're in, this, in the system, they're able to achieve a lot. But what the challenge is, actually, you, you told, once told me this great quote, like, there are lots of, what did you say, uh, Megan told me? Basically, you have to know that that opportunity is there. Yeah. Um, like, if you get here and you get in technology, then you have those opportunities. But if you don't even know yeah, those yeah, opportunities yeah. are there, you'll never actually get there. Well, we were talking, we were, we, we're all in a group called Women at Google. In fact, there's 19 employee resource groups at Google that were created by uh, the various teams to interconnect us. And actually, it turns out there's 30,000 Googlers, and I think there's 12 or 15,000 people on these lists. Um, so Women at is one that we participated in. Some of you guys are in the Google Women Engineering. Um, Gagglers, VetNet, uh, Black, uh, Black Googlers Network, Hispanic Googlers Network, Filipino Googlers, uh, Googler American Indian Network, just amazing nice. groups of people. Um, and, and so, you know, we were talking all about this and how uh, you, you have to get to the table. You have to, you basically, a lot of people out in the world don't know about the worlds we live in and how exciting they are. And so how do you tell people, especially when we're often in countries that are so highly racially divided or countries that are gender divided or, or um, you know, sometimes often for our, our companies, we're hiring so fast, we're like, who knows someone who from this? And so we just keep perpetrating the talent circles. And instead, like, who knows a woman? Who knows someone from an underrepresented group? In addition to just ask, asking the question in general, to get them in because there's a wonderful actual interview with uh, three African-American CEOs here in Silicon Valley and they're saying exactly what this, which is, if you can get here, it's a meritocracy in many ways. But finding out we're here, the tech industry is here, um, is, is an important thing to, to make happen. So one of the things that it, you mentioned media. Uh, Gathery organized a great event last year, which was a conference of the various women leaders and, and folks getting together. And we were lucky to have Gina Davis. And I don't know if anyone wants to mention some of her findings, but she did an extraordinary study of the media that we all watch for six-year-olds and under. And so you were talking about sort of what you see, like this loner engineer or the loner. But actually, the, the portrayal of women is interesting there. Um, I think she told us that it's two to three men or boys on screen to one girl or woman in cartoons and, and various things. She has a funny joke about the film Nemo, wonderful, one of my favorite Pixar films. But how many women or girls in the ocean? Yeah, there's one. So uh, it's story. I think there might be uh, some little girls on the, the swimming fish school, and, and mom gets killed, of course. But, uh, you know. uh, but there's one. So that's like really happening in the ocean, I guess. Um, <laughs> so you know, just that, that we grow up with this image that Smurfette, you know, that, that the world is made of lots of boys with one girl. And so we imagine this. And the one that was most telling, Anna, to your point, is about um, jobs. She said 80%, yeah, 80%, what was the stat, are held? 80% of the jobs in these uh, cartoons were held by men. Right. Or 80% of the jobs in shows targeted for the under six-year-olds were held by men. So the boys are learning that men hold the jobs in these jobs. The girls are learning that, in fact, Gina says boys will be boys and girls will be boys. You have to translate to be a boy uh, to think about being a scientist or an engineer or a business person. Uh, our lawyer were examples of people who are not even depicted in the 20% women. So. Okay, let's, uh, we should open up to some questions from you guys. I think there's some mics around. I have a little bit of, uh, a couple questions people have asked on, on the um, Google moderator. Um, but if there's, is there a mic around for these folks or we can pass one of these? Um, people, raise your hand if you have a question and we'll get you a mic. Um, Welcome. Okay. I teach at the local community college at Foothill, and I teach computer science. So I was wondering if you had any specific recommendations that I could do to convince the freshmen to become computer science majors and transfer and get a bachelor's degree? Yes. Um, I do a lot of college recruiting, and I, and I give tech talks at, um, at universities. Um, and I. I, I went into computer science myself without, um, you can't hear? Maybe hold, pull the mic closer. Um, Let's see. The mic actually works. Is that better? Okay. 
Um, I went into computer science without knowing anything about it um, from my from before going into university. Um, and I always tell people the story. I, I took the first class in computer engineering. I was going to do bioengineering. And um, I went into computer engineering. The first programming class was programming a game. And it was very, very um, engaging. I, Anna and I are, are, are programmers. Um, is it's just this thing that can hold your attention and immense creativity. And I think finding ways, and I have found, I'll continue to find that people feeling empowered that if they can create something out of nothing, make a game out of it, and make a, make, and inject creativity of, of it, seems to have a bend, particularly for, for women and for, for female students. Um, the, and you know, more of the creativity part of it rather than a technical side of it. That, that is inspiration and is also something that I think all of us can agree in creating products at Google. That's one of the things that's most exciting, creating something out of nothing in essence. Um, we're, we're, we're doing so with Google Wallet, with Play, um, with everything that we're doing here except for the phone is ringing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. And, and, it's, it's, and I think instilling that early into the program to let people see what they can really do. Um, it's, it's something that is incredibly important. Someone, Someone really to wants, Someone really to, wants to talk. Um, we'll, we'll turn it off. Sorry. So yeah, I mean, I, I'll just, it's interesting. I hadn't heard Angela say that before. <laughs> um, but it's actually like the thing that, that, I mean, I think computer science has this vision of being a more solitary kind of running statistics and numbers and, you know, but, but so I sort of fell into it by accident too. And I realized a lot of what Angela just said of how creative it actually was and the ability to actually make something and have that thing, you know, you know be usable and for people to see it all over the world. And, um, and that's what I really fell in love with. And when I like would describe that to other people, like, you know, it just wasn't, it's not always how computer science is, is represented, and so I think it's actually a challenge of how do you make it seen as like a creative building uh, and interacting and working on teams as a much more social experience. I think people would see it very differently. And I think um, it's also make sure you have a mic. Here, try to bring, pull that pull that mic down. The password. I think it's also important um, to illustrate just the impact that they can have. I know they're young and they're probably not thinking about that just yet, but um, I think it's very important, you know, I think um, the, the kinds of things that we do and the numbers of, the number of people, it's, it's not in the hundreds or thousands, it's in the millions. You can't build a, it, you can build a bridge, it's gonna take many years before a million people cross it. Um, you can write a great app and you could get a million downloads in a month. So it's, it's, it's one of those, um, it's it's here, it's now, it's uh, and it's explosive. So that the kind of impact that they can have is much more than they can expect to have in some of these other professions. And I think that's they should get a little bit of um, the sense of the um, the enormity of what they can do with you know starting out with a, a simple app or a game. We created a a, a, a product called um, App Inventor. Um, which just lets, mostly aimed at high school kids, help them put together apps. We especially want to target uh, high school girls to pull them into technology. Um, it's kind of scratch-like, and now the MIT Media Lab is running uh, that project. But um, just having people have their hands on stuff. I heard of a great uh, class, second grade class, that was taking Raspberry Pi, which is a little computer that costs about 45 pounds, doing scratch programming. And second graders have just learned to read, so why shouldn't they program? You know, so pretty interesting idea and pull them straight in and the girls and the boys were all in. Uh, so having them have experiences, I think, in addition to, I think, exactly like applying it to real amazing things. Another question. Hi. Um, I work for a company. I work for a company um, aimed to increase the number of female founders in technology startups. And one of the things we always focus on is to highlight like-minded individuals in the female world, technology, who have done things and we can look up to them. Um, and the younger generation also to have an iconic person to look up and say, okay, I can get there as well. 
Um, what is Google doing? This is the first year I see actually women being more involved and um, focusing on women entrepreneurs and technologists. Where is your focus going moving forward? Because as you mentioned, women are very important in technology today. We have, we have a huge number of programs that we run. We work really closely. We have so many different programs. I'm not going to think of them, but uh, they need a board program. So has, has everybody here been to the Grace Hopper celebration? If you haven't, you should go. It's two or, I think it's 3,000 computer science women now meeting in the fall that the Anita Borg Institute runs, which is great. We work really closely with them. Um, and we also uh, you know, do a lot of scholarship work with, women, with all different underrepresented people with women. Um, a lot of recruiting, a lot, a lot of those pieces. Susan, you, were, you had a couple. Were you going to say something? There's just a range of programs that, that we're doing. And, and also like this, like showing up. And there's actually a question in here um, about one of the internal meetings we posted uh, that's about um, one of the Dory questions or, or moderator asking why the internal meeting only had men talking. It was a search quality meeting. I think they were talking about spell check. And actually, typically, we're usually, our teams are more balanced. And so I don't know why that particular meeting. And it actually is a good example where someone checking us and saying, hey, you're putting a Google image of an engineering meeting out there. Make sure that the women in the team, or choose a meeting where there are women or underrepresented women, everybody's in the team the way we normally work. So it's really important, sort of back to the media point, what you project and who you try to help. Yeah. I mean, I think the other thing I would add is that I think it's not just there's like one iconic women, but that actually within the organization, everybody feels like there are people in my group that are like me, whatever that you know group is. And I think if you look across our organization, we have, because we've worked really hard at it, we have a good women representation um, across the different groups, across sales, across engineering, across all areas. But um, from a technical standpoint, it definitely, I mean, we have to work really hard to get uh, women uh, uh, computer scientists and software engineers into the program, so we we do have special recruiting to try to increase those that that group. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then we'll, then so, we'll Hello. So my question would be: Do you think it's worth like hiring women that are just interested about technology and then then training them? And do you have some program like that or? We do some programs like that. I actually heard of really um, a, an interesting one by, uh, oh my god, what's the name of the company? Social, huge company. Um, there's a group in DC, they're called, it's like Group on Social. Living Social. Social, thank you, I don't know why. Sorry, I'm sorry, Living Social. Anyway, this, I met this amazing guy from Living Social and he's been training people in DC in general on computer science and, and uh, has been making sure the classes are actually half balanced men and women just thinking very talented people. And, and that's, I think he's doing like a, almost like a three-month onboarding and then pulling people in because they just need more tech folks where they are. Um, I also heard an amazing thing that uh, Code Academy is 40% women, um, which is great. So definitely, we also have a wonderful program called Bold Practicum, which is taking underrepresented uh, minority top talent folks and getting pulling them into computer science. Because um, we need more people from those backgrounds in our field too. So definitely, we're we are part of that, and we're also funding some of the programs like that. And if people have ideas like that, we want to hear more. I mean, I would also say, like Google has Google as a representative tech company. We have many jobs that are for people who are not technical. We have sales, we have marketing, we have operations, we have lots and lots of different areas. And so anyone who has an interest can enter through multiple doors. Um, and you know, if they choose, like you know, they can go back and get more technical skills. But to be an engineer, you need to have the technical degree. The question here. Grab your mic. Or grab your mic. Or technical experience. Okay. Over here. So okay. Go here. Then. My question is um, in regards to the statement that was made a few moments ago about it being a very supportive culture at Google and how great it is to have someone in the room who's like you. So. What about those of us who are not fortunate enough to be in that type of environment where there is not someone in the room like us? What uh, recommendations or suggestions do you have for women in those situations? I think all, probably everybody has been in that position where you're sort of the only person, you're the only woman, or you're the only person from wherever that is. So I don't know, maybe talk a little bit about strategies in that situation. I mean, I, I think it's a hard situation to be in, and I'll just 
say like two things that come to mind. Um, I think first of all, like I worked at one organization before Google where um, it, that that uh, you know maybe I felt a little more isolated in. And but what I found is there were a couple other women that were there in that organization and what I and I basically we started to get together on a regular basis we wound up having lunch once a week um, or once every two weeks and I found that actually even though it was a small group by actually connecting we were able to form a pretty strong bond and having you know some set of people that I could connect to made a really big difference and like that they had shared experiences about that organization as well um, and then I say the second thing too is is that you know ultimately it's believing in what you're doing um, and trying to get what you're done, you know, what you think is the most important thing to be done as efficiently as possible and, and to, you know, make sure that your work is able to, to shine through and then if ultimately you feel like you can't for one reason or another to find, you know, a place where you can be recognized for the work that you're doing. It is definitely difficult to be the only one. I'm the only woman in the, my graduating class um, for uh, you know, many years ago now. Uh, and it was a small class, it was about a, you know, I think it was only 50 or 60 engineers. Um, and I find myself in a lot of design reviews and engineering meetings where I'm the only woman in the room. Um, what I've found at Google, and hopefully you can find this in other parts of the culture, a lot of men are also very supportive. Um, our other SVPs, Alan Eustace, is a very great champion for, for women in technology, as well as um, my, my manager, Jeff Huber. Um, these are senior vice presidents that, are, that will speak out. And um, they will find a connection by proxy in women they support. Um, and I have found actually in technology, um, the culture of technology is, is, is very rational and objective. And um, I find a lot of men to be, you know, actually great support for things that we need to do. And by proxy of them thinking about how they support their family, how they support their daughters. Um, and the experience in, 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 in these you know, proxy situations is, is good conversations to have to try to create a bond. Um, and so, you know, and, and also feeling confident to not, be, not feel isolated is important in finding other allies that can help. Um, I think it is important. In, you guys mentioned Alan Eustace. He's uh, ran engineering, much of engineering for many years and, and leads a lot of search now. Um, he shared an office with Anita Borg, so he has high consciousness uh, about women's issues. But um, he runs studies a lot. Like I remember, um, you know, he did a study where he was wondering whether women were not in Google. You put you can be you can put yourself like nominate yourself for promotion, or your manager might nominate you for promotion, and then you go through a process of very transparent culture. Um, and they were noticing that women were not nominating themselves as much as men. So they ran a study to see are women being promoted as much, and it turned out that women were being promoted. They were, the managers were then taking care of like nominating women and making sure that was happening. But something where he wrote an active email to the company asking that women uh, are nominate yourself and really encouraging people. And, and I think there is some amount of maybe uh, a friend of mine who won the Anita Borg uh, Awards, Mary Lou Jepsen. Um, has uh, synthetic hormones from a pituitary tumor, and she ended up taking testosterone and found that her confidence levels went up. So I don't know, somebody should study this. <laughs> she found other things too, but that was, watch the video of her speech, it's great. But, uh, but confidence, and so she said she really had a lot more understanding of the men she was managing and working with from that experience, which I thought was really an extraordinary thing for her and to hear that. And so think a little bit about confidence and maybe there are gender differences and maybe confidence or, or feeling like the imposter syndrome, like if they only find me out, um, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, but you really do. And having the confidence to put yourself up for promotion in this case. But also I think the more important thing there and your point of connecting to people was Alan also stepping up to, to you know, make sure there was space for people in the community and that they, that they were gonna become leaders in the same way was really important. Yeah, so let's see. We have a bunch of different questions. One of them actually is uh, one that's sort of a, a controversy out there. If any of you have read the Anne Marie Slaughter uh, recent article in The Atlantic entitled Why Women Still Can't Have It All, uh, regarding the unsolved problem of facing highly successful women who value time with their families, what is your reaction? That would be an interesting. Um, interesting one to talk about because there are trade-offs and, and challenges with balancing work and family and, and uh, relationships. One 
extraordinary thing is that both Anna and Susan have four children under 12, or 12 and under, yeah? So just you guys are doing that all the time at scale. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you, either of you or any of you guys have, have comments. We have two boys, and uh, you know, it's, I think technology is a little more forgiving than maybe perhaps say, you know, Anne-Marie who's in the state, was in the State Department, I think, in a, in a diplomatic role, traveling quite frequently. Um, I remember once talking to Sergey and giving a tour and he walked in and, and someone said, are people here all the time? And he's like, oh yes, they're here from very early in the morning till very late at night. Just not the same people. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this culture where our founders from the beginning, you know, we're very open to meritocracy, get the work done, we don't care when you're here. And I don't know if you guys have thoughts about that. I mean, I read the article, too. Um, I don't know how many of you have read it. I, um, I mean, I think these are very personal choices that people make. And, um, you know, I think if I look at the choices that I have, I feel like I have a lot more choices than the generation, than my mom's generation had. I have the ability to do, to have this amazing job running, like, an important part of Google's business and to, to have kids at the same time. And on the other hand, it's not like there aren't trade-offs. It's not like there aren't some compromises that I need to make on both sides. Um, but I'm very fortunate to live in this time and I feel like I, the message that I think is important to send to young girls is like you have all these opportunities. You have choices. Um, those choices are yours um, and there are trade-offs, but there are choices. And um, I, I, I believe that, that that's you know, that, that women, um, that we have all these great opportunities and like women should, cho if they choose, should take advantage of it. An average man or woman has, what, 45 years, a career spanning about 45 years. Your children are going to be with you 18 years maximum. And my kids are already out the door. Um, so I think that's something, something to recognize, that there will be periods of your time where you invest a little bit more in work and in other times where you pull back and invest in your family. But um, recognizing that these trade-offs will happen and recognizing that it's not going to be the same trade-offs over your career span, I think is very important for young women to realize. It's a, it's a long run game. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. When you have your first baby, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a five year horizon that you're looking at in investing for your career. I tell people when they come back from maternity leave right before, the, I'm like, you know, you won't realize, but somehow you won't actually get out the door on time and you won't, re like, you'll need to change your shirt three times and you'll, um, you know, eventually get here. But remember, babies are only a, a less than a year old for a year. You know, and so, you, <laughs> you know, so maybe you don't work as much that year, you know, as crazy, like 150% shipping and launching and all that. And maybe you in balance with your team and maybe you're not doing a total startup. But then you do a startup, you know, when they're a different age. So I think that's a balance for that. And also pregnancy gives you a really hard deadline. A <laughs> <laughs> schedule that doesn't I think, slip. I think the other thing people forget is if you work really hard and you have a good job, you can hire people who can help you. Um, and they will help you and you'll be able to get, you know, you'll be able to like help do more, have more time because you'll have help. Great. Great. Um, do you have women in tech leaders that you guys look up to? Who and why? I look up to Susan. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked with Susan for a long time. A lot of us have. And I think that I do, it really is one of the things that we've always had people look up to. And I totally sympathize where you are in an organization where you're not. Um, and I think that it, it really does help. And, and I, I don't know how to bring the, the Google culture to the rest of the of the world. We work really hard at this, um, and like you know, we have also leaders like like Alan um, that I greatly admire as a woman leader because he really does speak out for women a lot. Um, and I, I think as a community, you know, we all need to encourage our leaders. Also, sometimes they're a little shy about speaking out, but if you kick them, they will do it. Um, and and I think it's, it's it's us all encouraging each other. Um, to speak up for it, and I will, I will champion for the and see what sit with me campaign again, to just try to strike the conversation. It doesn't have to be controversial. It doesn't have to be emotional. Um, it's just talking to it. And I wanted to say that um, yeah, I, I tend to look up to people. 
or when, uh, not when they've done something spectacular, but when they've, they've really given back. And I will say this, and um, without embarrassing Susan and even Angela, because um, I've worked with both of them, is they found ways to sponsor other people in their org. In my, you know, some of them women, sometimes men. Um, but I think it's, um, they've invested, and, and often not overtly, it's, it's, it's often in, in ways that um, are behind closed doors, or it's that little nudge, it's sponsoring you in a meeting when you're not present. I think those are the kinds of things that they've done for the women in the org. And I know Angela has promoted several women in her org. Susan has, and I'm, an ex you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm a beneficiary of, of that. Um, so I think it's, um, I think it's great that we have women at Google who do this for other women. And I feel this is one thing that every woman, regardless of their level, this is something we can do for each other. Women tend to, uh, there's research that's found that when women tend to ask for themselves. Um, they are not liked as much as when they ask for others, which is probably why you, you all think that you're better at doing things for on behalf of others than yourself, because it's it's clearly a feedback loop there. So, if this is the if this is what um, we have to deal with, then let's let's make the most of it and let's try and help other women. Sponsor someone, say something nice about someone um, when they're not in the room. You know, see the see those thoughts in um, in people and. And I think that's, that's the way we can bring each other up. Terrific. Ian, back to the room. Hi. Um, I work here in Silicon Valley, and um, frequently I'm the only woman in the room or the only woman in the forum. Um, and I'm the community manager, so I spend a lot of time using your products, Google products. Um, and I wanted to thank you all first for investing your time and effort to have this event here, the pre-event dedicated to women. Um, and I wanted to make a comment and kind of also ask you for what your plans are in the future because you know I was all amped up and it's like oh my god I quit you know I, I stopped work like I like had my last meeting three o'clock hop in the car get over here check in at Google I.O. and I'm ready to go here and they give me a t-shirt and it's size small man's <laughs> and I kind of thought maybe they didn't understand as when, when they asked me to register, they asked what my, you know, MS, Ms, right, female, and I got this invite, so Google definitely knows I'm a woman. <laughs> are you guys sure that those maybe green or gray ones are, don't come in women's sizes? Yeah. No, this is the smallest you get. Yep. It's, yeah, it's either this or the XL, oh. you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then it's kind of hard for... And, I'm not the kind of woman who's intimidated, as you can tell. So <laughs> that still makes me feel unwelcome. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to make this a big issue or a confrontational thing, because oh, we're all women and we don't do that. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, I show up and I want my shirt, and I don't want to be told that I can sleep in it. Right, right. <laughs> so I hope I would like to encourage you, like, what are your plans for next I.O.? How are you going to make women who show up like me and they're like, oh, my God, I'm so excited. And I don't care that I'm going to be one maybe per hundred attendees, just one woman. But I'm here. How are you going to make it even better next year? And thank you again. Sure. Um, thank you very much. You know, I love people like you. Like, you know, we... When we see great ideas, then we can execute on them. So definitely, let's like work on the T-shirts. Um, <laughs> that would be good. Um, but I think you know, Susan, we had an event. We, what's that? Don't make it pink, yeah. No, definitely not. <laughs> I ran planet out. We had a rule like no rainbows. Oh, I'm sorry. That's it was the gay community online and web yeah. um, So yes, no pink. Well, some pink for the people who like pink. But Susan, we had an event. Um, at Susan's house, we were lucky she hosted us, and, uh, and you were talking about how it's important to have gatherings where we come together, whether it was the group when you had very few women, like find other women in the company somewhere, and partner companies, and just build community. And so our hope is that this event is the beginning of kicking that off and really recognizing in a very public way, as part of the IO agenda, that we really, as an industry, need more women at the table designing and building everything. And uh, it's a really important part. Susan, you've got something. No, I was just going to say, I think it's great feedback. And um, we should, we'll communicate it. 
Um, <laughs> and next year we'll have women's t-shirts. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So uh, Al, we mentioned Alan Eustace because he's a big supporter of women. He mentioned uh, we, we, I was at TG, our, uh, I was on stage with him, and he said, "You know, I went to the I think it was the Grace Hopper conference." And he said, I know what it felt like because I got a lipstick USB. <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy. Why do I get so that? I think that's the opposite experience of what yeah, you just that had. Good. That's really good. You know, and, and you know, we talked about Alan, but also, you know, credit to Larry and Sergey. They've always been really um, just open minded about talent inclusion, which is the way I think of a diversity and um, just the way we work, not only inventing, inventing products, but also how our company should be. And early on, I, I was not there for this, but Marissa tells a story of uh, Larry getting yet another, you know, guy's resume for engineering across his desk to improve. And he just said, he said, okay, you get a couple more of these, but if there are no women in the queue, there's no more hiring. And so to take that kind of leadership, you know, as the CEO at the time, was really a significant move, and it sets the tone. They always wear the women at Google shirts and, and the Gagler shirts, whatever. They're really sort of trying to re-represent the company back to us. And uh, so that's another, I guess, action item I would say is an, ask your leaders to team up with you, and maybe if you need to give them some of these examples, but they're there. So I, I think we're at time. Um, one question. I, Oh, one more question. Okay, it's one a more quick question. question. Yeah. Um, I'm a software engineer, Yay. and I interviewed at Google, and I was interviewed by all men, and I thought it would have been advantageous for both sides to have at least one woman interview me, and I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. We, we, uh, we try really hard. We used to have the rule, a hard and fast rule, that that had to happen, and as the company... Um, you know, we have different times where we have very fast hiring velocity. And so in one of those times, it's uh, relaxed a little bit. But it's usually a hard and fast rule. That's an important, important point. Um, I guess to close with something exciting that I learned recently, um, Walter Isaacson, of course, wrote the amazing book about Steve Jobs' uh, biography. And uh, I recently read that he is working on a biography of Ada Lovelace. And he's doing this um, because he became aware of her from his daughter, who's 21 and I think just finishing in computer science. And I had never heard of her until I went to Silicon Valley Comes to the UK. And there's actually a portrait of her at 10 Downing Street. We were lucky to be there for an Apathon contest judging. And there she was. And for those who don't know her, she was uh, teamed up with uh, um, Babbage um, on the Babbage engine. And she was really the first person not woman, not man, first person to come up with the idea of sort of symbolics and the idea of what is, is sort of programming. It was a mechanical n computer at the time, but really, the, really kind of really the world's first programmer, first symbolics uh, thinker. So pretty exciting to see kind of our history begin to come back at us um, in that way. So I'm looking forward to reading that book and learning more and her inspiration as we go forward. So thank you, you guys and my fabulous colleagues, and thanks to all of you for being here.